we were in Vegas and we had an argument because his, his now wife uh, complained because he didn't like her video. And that's vanity, right? If, if, you, if you're so tied to it that it hurts your feelings or your, your mental health, then that's vanity. And it absolutely, people are right when they call it vanity metrics. Hi, and welcome to Road to Revenue, Genius Links podcast, inviting creators to come in, talk about the bumps in the road, the twists, the turns, everything about understanding what there is to know about bringing revenue in as a creator today. Joining us today, we've got Matt Hughes, Video King. Welcome, Matt. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here uh, after meeting some of your guys in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so that was at uh, Vid Summit, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Creators Conference, big Creators Conference in Dallas. I love, love that event. And um, I happened to just go into a, a birthday party. It was Roger Wakefield, um, famous YouTube plumber. Um, it was his birthday, and so I saw your guys there, and I was amazed because I, 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 I've used your product for a long time, and and it's one of those things where I never thought I'd meet the people. I'd meet the P made it. You know, that are kind of in the world, and you just yeah. think. Well, I'm never going to meet them. Why would I ever meet them? It'd just be a strange situation now was and we had a beer together, so it's great. Brilliant. But do you know what it is? It's it's one of those it's quite funny. We um we're 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 behind the scenes in a lot of creator journeys. Um so so yeah, we, we don't really get that normal face to face uh all the time. So great that you could uh, meet up with the guys. Um, with with the revenue side, um and, and that's really what we want to dig into, right? Like really want to understand the nitty gritty parts. Don't want to go into total all the tactics, but we want to get some nuggets out of you. But tell me first off, from a revenue perspective, what what channels are you are you bringing in revenue from? What streams have you got um, diversified? What does it look like for you? Okay, so so my whole thing as King of Video is to teach people how to create a revenue stream using YouTube. Right. right, so it's not necessarily on YouTube. I, I'm a, I'm not monetized on YouTube right now. I've got a small channel, um, but I make good money off my YouTube channel. And I think that's one of the key things when when you mentioned this podcast. It's one of the key things I wanted to highlight straight away. It's like, actually, if you talk to a lot of YouTubers, monetization on the platform directly is a small percentage of their total revenue. Yeah. that they bring into their business. So I really need people to understand that when you're thinking about YouTube as a revenue source, yes, it, it does definitely bring in money, but it doesn't have to end there. And actually, if you're strategic with what you're doing, you should have other revenue streams, other ways to make money that your YouTube channel directly impacts. And that's the, the big key thing, I think. So how many um, So how many streams of income do you actually have currently? How many streams of income? It's a magic question, isn't it? I'd say probably five. Really? Five. But if, we talk, if we talk about them, we're probably going to do, find out there's 11. <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows? Who knows? I think probably five, yeah. Going without too much of a pause in my head, I think that's probably about right, yeah. Okay, okay. And and, and you've been, I mean, you, this is not your first rodeo, right? You, you've been doing this for what, half a decade? Uh, yeah, so I I started a video company in 2013. So we're we're just 10 years old in September. I wow, actually so closed the, a full decade. Closed the business. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So I closed that um, three years ago. Um, but at the time, it, it wasn't a full time gig. Actually, I was an IT contractor, and that was a side hustle. Um, and I did it because I really it really sounded like a good thing to do. And I just made it that if I took a day off my IT contracting, that I would charge the same when we were doing the video gig and we ended up with a team we had sort of i think at one point we had five of us in the team uh, we traveled the world we went to vegas copenhagen south africa barcelona amsterdam all over the place uh, filming uh, video uh, largely for tech companies i think we went to big microsoft events and we took you know filmed sponsors on their stands that kind of thing um so yeah that's that's where it all started definitely and and so like that that's a journey in itself, right? I mean, that, that, yeah. Before you even get to the road revenue conversation, um, the the road to video is is really kind of what that sounds like. It 
were there big learnings that you brought across from that and that you've transferred into being a creator for yourself and then sharing it, uh, sharing it over? And I guess the other question is, what's your favorite bit that you've kind of brought from that experience that you now share with uh, with people who learn from you? Yeah, I think I think it's probably the business side of things. I remember I have got a a link to my first Facebook Live, and at the time, and I tell people about this all the time because. I had ten thousand pounds worth of equipment to do that first Facebook Live. I had a, a proper camera, I had some lighting, a proper microphone, I'd bought some software to do the broadcasting. And it is truly awful, you know, like it's truly the worst Facebook Live I've ever done. Um but at the time we were making like professional videos for companies, right? You know, million million to billion dollar companies. And so I assumed that and and if I was gonna do this thing I, and be in front of the camera I needed to make sure it looked perfect. Right. And, and actually, in the end, I, I was coached by somebody at the time and they said, you know, you just got to go and do this stuff. You've got to get out there. And, and I did. And I, I was like a little mouse, you know, talking to her. I was like, I'm going to go live every day for six months. Um, well, I think I said three months I would go live every day. And I, and I actually did it for six months. It was every work day. Right. I did it around the same time at 11 a.m. And I just wanted to do it. And this is this is the the answer to your question. I just wanted to do it to understand what it felt like to be consistent, what it felt like to be on in front of camera all the time, what it felt like to come up with content ideas, uh, what it felt like to be in another situation. So I remember doing a live that I did when I went to see Phil Collins. If you know Phil Collins, yeah, um, I went to see him in Hyde Park at British Summertime Festival, and I remember doing a live there. You know, with people around me, and there's little situations like that that. It, when you start to become comfortable on camera in front of the camera you learn that it's okay that there's people around you as long as you've got a lapel microphone or yes. something that will keep the sound pretty good the confidence that you have from you know being consistent really comes across and and helps you move forward so i think there's all, all sorts of transferable skills that you get but i think standing in front of the camera even though i'd been doing it you know filming for years yeah. that was probably a, a really hard move and something that I had to get over uh, as we started making uh, our own content as well. So, what's the, uh, the the most? I mean, Phil Collins is is pretty up there. But are, are there any yeah. other memorable stories from that time? Uh, well, yeah, I'll I tell you one memorable sto- story that really directly relates to revenue. Is it, what what I did is I set myself this goal to to go live every workday. So when I was in the office for three months. Um, as I said, it went on for uh, six months in the end. I always wore a blue shirt, happened to always have the same outfit on when I went into the office. Um, that was to attempt the lack of decision fatigue. Right. Um, and I remember somebody going into my inbox and saying, hey, Matt, um, I'd love to work with you on this thing, right? And And what I learned was if you show up consistently – Instead of having to go and find business and do sales, people would come to you. And what happened with this guy is he, he it happened to be we had a website business as well at the time. And I was just talking about like how we were going to create revenue in that website. We were like our focus was getting to six figures. And we and I was I had a little whiteboard behind me and I was illustrating how we would get to that. And he slid into my DMs and he said, Matt, um, I've got a website, need it built in, can I come and have a call? And he came into my office and not only did that happen where he, he bought the business to me, I didn't have to like sell it to him. He yeah. definitely wanted to work with me. But he also just walked into my office as though he knew who I was. And this, right. when you meet people in business, there's a kind of bit of an awkwardness where you kind of say hello, they say hello. You're like trying to work out both what your motives are and, you know, it's almost like dating. You've got that kind of like weird awkwardness about it, or maybe I was just an awkward dater. Um, but there was none of that. He just walked in, almost walked past me. I don't even know if we shook hands. And he just sat in my settee, on my settee that we had in the office at the time. And, um, sorry, sofa. I don't know if Americans say settee, settee sofa. Um, but we, but he sat down and we just had a conversation and it was just so easy. And, and so like, I just really think about that when I'm thinking about do you show up on camera often um, and what is the outcome of that in terms of sales and revenue? It's it's that people want to work with you 
And sometimes you don't know if they're watching, you don't know how many people are watching, if the right people are watching. Hopefully that all of that is true. But um, eventually, if you do it consistently, they'll just show up and say, right, I'm ready to work with you now. Yeah, the um, I mean, the, the saying is no like and trust. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of doing business, people want to know you, they want to like you, they want to trust you, and they'll do business with you. And, and there is like a, there's, there's a, there's an intimacy that can be built up by that consistency. So, yeah, and I, I, I describe it as accelerating that no like and trust factor. You know, I've got um, a framework, like five A's. One of the A's is accelerating. And when I talk to people about starting YouTube channels, I'm like, this is how you accelerate that whole process. You know, if you you, you think about it now, if you're you're thinking, um, I've got an event or I'm getting married or something, you need a photographer, right? If if you want to get any engagement on Facebook, go and ask for a photographer because. They, people will tag in a hundred photographers. Everybody knows a photographer, right? Um, so if you're in that sea of people, how do you stand out? Whereas if you can send it, a, you know, a, a YouTube channel which shows like loads of things about you, your process, some of the work you've done before, your case studies, all that kind of stuff. It's like your own Netflix channel, and people can just binge watch until they're ready to give you their credit card number, which is which is the pinnacle of sales, right? Yeah, yeah, and it. It, it's interesting because, I mean, you talked about the consistency and you don't know whether people are actually watching or not. Yeah. How how tied up do you get with the, the vanity metrics, with, with actually whether people are commenting, whether people are actually liking, whether they're engaging with the video? Or do you do you look at other metrics? I'm so glad you asked that question. I call vanity metrics valuable metrics. Right. So I want you to change the word that you use because it is a big thing in the online space that people call these metrics vanity metrics. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Let me start that question again. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll tell you why. Let, 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 let me explain why because mm, okay. actually it is true, right? If I, if I couldn't sleep tonight because I only got 10 likes on my video, then it is vanity, right? I, I even... The guy I started the video company with originally, I remember he had an argument. We were in Vegas and we had an argument because his his now wife, who was his his fiance at the time, uh, complained because he didn't like her video. Um, it, you know, it's like eleven a.m. in the morning. And he, she messaged him and they had an argument once we were at the outlets. So I remember it's it's like it was yesterday, and that's vanity, right? Yes. If, if you if you're so tied to it that it hurts your feelings or your your mental health then that's vanity. And it, absolutely, people are right when they call it vanity metrics. So I don't want you to change it because it's it's true. But when I'm talking about being strategic with your YouTube content or your social media content, that's where it becomes valuable because actually you need those metrics to understand what what content works, what doesn't work. And I sp- spoke to a guy uh, called Jesse Davis. He's a, a huge YouTuber in, in Thailand. Uh, actually, his, his daughter, Brianna's World, is one of the biggest... Uh, YouTube channels in Thailand, eight million subscribers or something. Okay. And he said to me when they first started, they published something like fifty videos. And and what they were doing when they were doing that was testing the vanity metrics. They were looking at these really valuable metrics and saying, of the eight different types of ideas, it was a kids channel. So they they I came up with eight ideas of kids content. And they said, which ones are the ones that are hitting home? And, and they were able in that quick, by paying attention to those met- metrics, they were able to ditch four of the ideas straight away and then double down on the four types of content that they'd uh, eventually come up with. I don't, he didn't mention what they were. Uh, but but isn't that fascinating? Actually, when you think about those being really valuable, all of a sudden you can see why people go from 200 views on TikTok, which is where a lot of us are, are stuck, and then some people hit 2 million views because so you're looking for the stuff where, where if you're in that testing phase that all algorithms do and you're st- you know, around, that, around that 200, 300 mark, um, what is the video that moves you beyond that? And how can you do more of that content? And so, so with the metrics then, which of the metrics, is there a hierarchy that you look at for, and, and is it tied to the content? Is it tied to the strategy or are you really looking at, at where the revenue will play out on the long uh, on the long game? Yeah, so I suppose it depends on your it just depends on your goals. Uh, again, I, I did an interview with a guy called Jerry, and he said 
He was one of the first people I've ever seen say this to me. And he said, um, when I started YouTube, he's on about 120,000 subscribers now. He said, when I first started YouTube, I just thought I'll commit to it for a year and see where we got to after that. And I was like, oh my God, Jerry. Like I've never, when I speak to people that want to start YouTube, they're like, "Uh, what, what, what results do you think we'll get in the first month? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean the first month? Well, you'll have four videos. Like you, you won't get any results in the first month. Like, can we just think about the first year? When I started my podcast, I think I'm on episode nine or something like that now. Mm. Like, my views are terrible. My or my downloads, you know, it's different on podcasts. But my my downloads are terrible. Like, I I, I don't care. I'm not I'm not worried about it because I'm like, when I get to episode fifty. I know the cumulative effect of what's going to happen. And so then I'll start to look at the metrics. I mean, you know, this is why it's a difficult answer to the question because I'm doing the opposite of what I've just said with with um, uh, with what Jesse did. Jesse went hard, published loads, paid attention to the metrics, and then agile, it moved in an agile way to, to sort of find the answer. Yeah. With me with a podcast, because it's kind of one of the second, third, maybe – streams of marketing that i'm doing it's not a big priority to me i'm just happy to do it but do it for a probably long period of time whereas with my youtube channel i'll probably pay more attention to the metric so i don't think i've answered the question because because it's such a difficult question to answer that's why you know yeah so so i guess if, if do you for looking at a on a looking at it from a channel by channel basis then yeah when you look at, at youtube you're have you got a you've got a hierarchy of of factors that you're looking at you want to look at the metrics that mean the most to you yeah do you think about revenue when you're looking at those metrics i always think about revenue because i'm financially driven yeah some people are not some people want to do things for the love of it and all that kind of stuff but i'm always financially driven um but i I think about it strategically so for me to stop talking and consider what you were saying in the last couple of seconds i think about one of my clients she is a coach and we strategically set up her channel. And by the time we got to something like 12 weeks in or something like that, she'd only got 2,000 views and she'd got 150 subscribers. And I was telling her to do all these marketing things and, and extra things that we could do to get more people onto her channel. But she ended up with a £6,000 coaching client off the back of it. And so actually when we got to like reviewing where we were at and what we were doing, like that hit the money in the bank answer to the, that question, you know, what was more important? Is it that we got low views or low subscribers or was it more important that we were finding the right audience and getting cash in the bank? And I think the answer has to be cash in the bank if you're running a business. Yeah. Um, the views are good and there's some people that are just do it all for views and all for likes and all that kind of stuff. But what are really your goals that you're trying to get out of the start? And for me and the people that I work with, my thing is called YouTube for Business. We're focused on getting in front of the right people at the right time to get money and revenue into our business. So That's very much think. profit yeah. first uh, kind of mentality. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay, okay, brilliant. Well, so with that, are there some projects or I guess some types of content that you would like to continue making, but actually they just don't make sense revenue wise? Like are there are there some of the the babies you had to let crawl away? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose it's a kind of it, it, you kind of content that you want to create. I, I mean, I really admire those people that make content because they love it. They just love the content. They don't really care about anything else and and they want to make make that kind of content. You know, I have these conversations with some of the YouTube groups because people are talking about um, how to monetize, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but there's some people that really grow big. They're not thinking strategically, but they just love what they're doing. And I think about vloggers a lot of the time. I think there's quite a lot of effort that goes into that and you have to really love it to do it. Mm. So I don't think, I think vlogging for me would be hard because it's just like pottering around my house doing normal things you know and i'd have to come up with some kind of concept around that whereas actually for me i love doing like how to's and i love um product reviews and and teaching people stuff that makes more sense to me and and when it comes to money getting brand deals around that kind of content is just the best because then then it aligns with what i love i mean 
you know, imagine those vloggers getting stuff like uh, free clothes and other thing, other benefits you get out of having that kind of channel. Whereas for me, yeah, free software, um, uh, you know, getting getting paid to do those videos. We, we I got a, a huge community. I became a community manager for a software company off the back of a video that I had. And I'd only got 700 subscribers at the time. And it was yeah. worth a lot of money for me, that contract. I was there with them for eight months. So, it you know, it really can happen. And it can be in the, the arena that you love doing the type of content that you love. You don't have to dance on TikTok if that's not your thing, you know. So with your, with your um, just to speak to that a moment, with your experience, how much of, of the economy, the creator economy is hidden, do you think, that that people don't necessarily talk about or hear and and revenue that appears in inboxes yeah but never becomes you know um communicated yeah i think i think it's not talked about as much i I think the focus often is monetization and how much revenue you can get from ads and so a lot of people are working towards monetization all the time and they're focused on that if only i can get monetized i'll do this and it's like well actually realistically you have to get millions of views to get a good amount of money even if you're getting a bit of money per thousand views or whatever it it doesn't translate to like a full-time job really quickly whereas actually i think if you focus on those hidden things the off-platform revenue streams that's where you make real money that's where the coach client of mine made money because she already had a defined business that was delivering a high ticket service and so when the audience came in the viewer came in with the views the small amount of views she was able to farm them off to a presumably a lead magnet at the time is where they probably came in and then some kind of offer off the back of it and and if you think about it if you think yourself like how you buy things you'll watch somebody or you'll see a product of some description somewhere and you'll see someone talking about it or you'll see someone reviewing it or whatever and that's the thing that makes you move in in my from my world you know my wife's probably more of a she reads reviews and stuff but for me if i see something i want to see something in action i'm a very visual moving picture kind of person so the video makes the perfect sense for that you know so with them um, with the revenue that you're that you're currently focused on yeah and and diversified and and not trying to build a big 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 channel what's your What's your favorite revenue? Like, what's the uh, one that you actually most enjoy? Uh, I tell you, well, there's two. There's two things. I mean, I, I'm totally focused on the conference right now, so I, um, that's a revenue stream that is interesting. Um, my favorite ever re- revenue stream was my membership, which I closed recently. Um, I closed it because it it wasn't quite growing the way I wanted it to. The reason it was my favorite is because it really only cost me about an hour or two a week. Right. Um, I think probably if I'd have spent more time on it, marketed it, it we wouldn't have had to close it. Um, but in terms of delivery of stuff, that was great because I had all this content, all these courses that I'd created. People could come in and, and you know, we just got together every week and I just answered loads of questions. And like, I love being a solution kind of person. So, I've got a, a strategy call thing where you can book me for an hour and, and, and I answer a load of questions that you've got. And I always tell people like, just go away and find 20 questions related to your video stuff and I'll, we'll go through them all on the call. Um, I just love those kind of kind of sessions, I think. That's, that's my favorite stuff to do is just my membership when we had the weekly calls and then the strategy calls um when someone books me for an hour but it's a really bad way to make money selling selling yourself by the hour is just a bad way to make money maybe that's why i love the membership because it's kind of like passive income recurring income and i still get to answer the questions right so with that i've got i've got to ask then yeah what's the question that keeps coming up so when in your membership what's the one that because there's there's two bits like one i want to know what that question is that people keep asking that you keep having to answer again and again and again. Well, to be honest with you, that's how I started my um, YouTube channel. My, my most popular video video on my YouTube channel is how to not be sideways when you're going live on Facebook. And it, and that was just 
years ago, that was like the question people asked me the most when people are just getting into lives, they knew lives were a good idea. And so I just, I created the video. It was like two minutes long and it was just because I got fed up of answering the questions. So I just said, go, go and watch the video. I'll show you how to fix it. Um, I mean, there's common questions that people ask when it comes to getting started, you know, things like what's the best webcam? Um, My answer to that is all webcams are terrible. Use your phone. Um, Things like how do I come up with content ideas? How do I stay consistent? It, It really, and, and there's like a cycle. So when new members come or used to come into the membership, we would get all of those questions at the start. Uh, and then it was all about consistency. Oh, I couldn't do my video this week, so what do I do about that? Oh, we'll do some batch filming. Okay, if I do batch filming, what do I need to do? Well, you need to have a, a permanent setup so it's easy, so you're in the right energy. Um, how do you stay in the right energy? Well, find, you know, you've got to find your rhythm, find when you're good. Uh, for women, they have cycles, So, and a large part of my um, audience were women. So I was like, okay, pick the, the other weeks where it, you're not in a bad part of your cycle and make sure you film in that at that time um so there's all these weird and wonderful questions that you that you get but eventually at, at running something like that a membership they, they're the same kind of question you know you just tailor them to the person because you can part of part of being a sort of coach or a mentor is just understanding who it is that you're talking to and what their challenges are mm-hmm. and then tailoring the answer tailoring the answer to them so it's hard when you just you know if you're selling courses You've got to be quite broad and accommodate everybody. But when you when you're in a group setting like that, you can really listen to the the challenge of the person and then answer it in a way that makes them hopefully take action. So what about what about myths? There's got to be a couple of myths that people keep bringing up that just won't seem to go away. Well, we, we I mean we've talked about some of them, right? So vanity metrics that's yeah. that's one that's one definite myth. Um, uh, I, I actually did. I don't know if I took it off my YouTube channel. I did a 12 myths of Christmas, a 12 myths of YouTube. And it was like a Christmas countdown thing. Um, So that if they're there, if they're not there, they'll be on my Instagram and they'll probably be on my Instagram in the next few weeks because we're filming in November. Um, And my team are definitely going to just reuse that content because they're really nicely branded and all all that kind of thing. Um, I think one common myth to me is that you need loads of equipment. A lot of people say, you know, I'm not ready for YouTube because I I don't have the right equipment. Another common myth is you need to be confident on camera when actually you just need to get started. Mr. Beast wasn't confident. You can see that the first two years of his videos were um, him talking over playing video games. It wasn't him on camera. Um, other kind of myths are things like uh, you need to be an expert uh, which which is definitely not too true. You, actually, the story of becoming an expert is just as important as being the expert. Um, oh, I just thought another one is gone. The other one will come back to me in a minute. Oh yeah, that was it. the The other myth, the other really good one is is it's oversaturated. Right. My industry, you know, it's already been done. It, somebody's in my industry has already taken that part of my niche, so I can't do it. When actually, when actually the most beautiful part of all of this content creation stuff is that you are the unique thing. And so if you are the unique thing, only you can only deliver the message in the way you can deliver that message. And so like, I get people that are like, oh, well, if I give away all my stuff on YouTube, like no one will ever buy anything from me, especially if they're course creators, content creators, that kind of thing. And I'm like, well, it's actually the opposite. When you give so much away, people are like, well, how can I work with you then? Like, what what can I do to get closer to you? And I don't mean that in a stalker way. I mean it in like a, if you invite people to come and do group coaching programs or come to do your course or whatever, even though all the content is probably online, they want to learn from you. They want to get closer to you. So yeah, the the my industry is saturated. There's too many people doing it. It's just, it's just so wrong. And actually, when you look at it, if if I was to say my industry is uh, video creation, mm-hmm. and I would say, look in the UK, there's a hundred thousand video creators. Okay, okay, that's a lot of people. How many of them are on YouTube? Twenty five. <laughs> and then you go, well, actually, 
because they're you know they're busy doing content creation for other people they've not got their own youtube channel they're not prepared to to stand there and have the confidence to sit in front of a camera so um yeah it's never saturated that's that's the biggest myth i'm sure yeah there's a um and, and with that a conversation that i i often have is around providing content and providing information for you know for free is yeah we've moved very much beyond the democracy of information yeah nothing is really locked away anymore and and we moved from that democracy so it's it's more around the conversations that i have or around curating content um, and then facilitating actually implementing that content and and that's the part that yeah like you say well that part is never going to be saturated because that's all about the individual yeah yeah and and it's such, such weird things right you know uh, i talk to my wife about this often we talk about the fact that there's nobody in the world that is completely liked because even you can meet someone who's the nicest person who just seems to make everybody feel welcome they're really loving and caring and all that kind of stuff and somebody will turn around and say don't like that guy he's just too nice it's just something not right about him you know what I mean so like you can't you can't win but so everyone has these weird and wonderful things that they think about people even down to like don't like the guy's forehead, don't like the guy's accent, don't like the guy's hair colour, his skin colour, all of those things that actually uh, are in people's minds are the reason why you should go and do the thing and be the person because actually there's somebody waiting for somebody like you because the alternative is someone they don't really like and they're just following them because they don't, don't like them but they give the best information. Yeah. Whereas if you can come along they like you and you give away good information, um then you can you can win for the, from that definitely. So you mentioned TubeFest. Yeah. Super exciting. Yeah. Not as far away as it it might seem. Yeah, we're <laughs> very close to launching it now. I, I, this is this is like the I've never been so nervous about something in my life, but I've never been so excited about the future um and also i'm i'm undiagnosed adhd my wife did a, a mental health for children course recently she tested me for with the adhd test and i got 100 percent. Right. so i was like oh uh, maybe maybe i'm undiagnosed and I, I often go from one thing to another and having something like tube fest gives me like a real big focus and everything draws me back to that so i think it's nice as well from us from my own mental uh, abilities to focus on that yeah because it, it it isn't something that happens overnight it's not something that you can create in a in a weekend no how how long have tell us a little bit around how long you've been working on it what your idea is yeah. behind you fest and really what you want it to be able to deliver yeah sure so so um we, we didn't explain it we just wanted to keep talking about it two fest is a, a, a video marketing conference it's happening in the uk may 23rd in birmingham in the uk and the idea came because I traveled to the US to conferences all the time. When I was doing the, when I had the video production company, we were traveling and we worked in the US a lot. And it's great. I love traveling, um, but it is expensive and it's long. And I went to San Diego to Social Media Marketing World this year. And I'm, I'm 40 now and I feel like the jet lag is hitting me so much harder when I go to the, what is it, West Coast? West Coast, yeah. When I go to the West Coast, I, I just struggle loads to, to kind of acclimatize to the time zone, you know. And I, and But I love it. But I love the events. I love networking. I love the community. I love the people and the parties as well, I should add. Um, and so when I was there, I was like, do you know what? I think if I was looking around in the UK and around Europe and I was like, I don't think there's a video marketing conference that happens. We used to have VidCon, which is more of a fans conference. And I was like, I wonder if I can do something like my favorite conference, which is, was Vid Summit at the time. And I wonder if we could do something like that in the UK. So I, I thought about it in March in San, Social Media Marketing World. And I was like, maybe I'll do it in a couple of years. You know, I need to build an audience. I need to do this. Uh, th and this is an important thing, right? All the excuses in my mind came up. Everything that stops you doing anything all went through my mind. And so I had a crazy summer planned. I had festivals, all that kind of stuff. 
And then I got to Vid Summit uh, just before Vid Summit, actually. I was sort of planning to go there. And I think I'd been to another event and I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to do it. Like, if I don't do it now, somebody else is going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to be so annoyed that someone else has done it. And I, and I didn't execute on that idea. And so about a week or two before Vid Summit, me and my team decided, and I said, I'm going to go to Vid Summit. I'm going to find some sponsors, find some speakers. And then we're going to, we're going to push the button and do it. So now we are, we are about a week and a half away from launching the thing, which is brilliant. Just, oh no, it is, it's absolutely amazing. And, and, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the more conferences we have dotted all across the world, then yeah. the better, because not everyone can afford to travel no, halfway around the globe. No. And, yeah. and, and actually, even if they can afford it, some people just can't afford the time. Yeah. So having something on on the doorstep for a lot of people, and um, certainly for our, um, uh, our our US audience and uh, our Canadian audience, the the scale of the UK is absolutely tiny. Um, but uh, you know, being able to travel down the halfway through the country to an event is totally doable in a day. Um, yeah. So no, great that you're great that you're putting it on. So what's your What's the key thing that you're trying to achieve with TubeFest? What do you what do you want to what people to walk away saying happened at TubeFest or what they got out of it? As a as a sort of seasoned conference uh, speaker, attendee, organizer, um, I care about all of those people, the sponsors, the speakers, and the attendees. And I and I've seen I've been to so many conferences where. They make so much money from sponsors that they're, all they care about is the sponsors and they will do anything for them. I've seen conferences where they're fully focused on the speakers. They make them feel like rock stars, but then they forget about the attendees. And then um, I've been to events where the speakers are terrible. There's, you know, they've got no sponsors and, and the attendees are like, oh, what's happened here? You know, um, so I just want to try and make as many people happy as possible and and that's quite a big thing as well um because i know it's not possible to do all of those things but i think if i make it a great experience all around i hope it's something that people will say i hope i can listen to this podcast in a year's time and people are saying i can't wait to go back to two fest you know that 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 is the dream really because it's a 10 year plan i, I want to do this every year at least for the next 10 years brilliant I and I I don't think there's any reason why you can't because it certainly from the little I've seen uh, already and talked to you about it sounds like it's going to be absolutely incredible and yeah we've got amazing speakers when when yeah, do, so do we know when this is going to go out can we talk about them now um so we are <laughs> uh definitely cutting this bit uh, yeah <laughs> um I have not got a full commitment but I'm looking at January. Okay, great. Um, shall, shall we talk? Shall we talk about speakers then? Shall we? Yeah. Shall we just talk about speakers? That, knowing that nobody else knows about the speakers except for me and you right now. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah. So, um, tell us, tell us about some of the speakers okay. you've got lined up. Great. So, um, at Vid Summit this year, I met Austin Armstrong and Nick Nimim. Uh, Nick has the Niminati. <laughs> I don't, don't know how you say it, um, but. And he's just hit uh, 900,000 subscribers. And Nick only does Vid Summit. So he tells me he doesn't do any other conferences. And so we've kind of got a European exclusive, which I'm really excited about. Um, Nick is one of the most humble, lovely people to be around. With My f- first Vid Summit, I remember going there and I, I knew nobody. I, I remember going on Twitter to try and find some friends because it's the first conference I've been to where I know nobody. And it was in uh, Los Angeles at the time. And Nick was like, oh, come and have dinner with us. Come and have a drink with us. He's just, just such a welcoming guy. And so I knew if I was ever to do something like that, Nick would be the guy that I wanted to be my international speaker. Yeah. So uh, so I was fortunate enough to see him at a bit of something and asked him. And then uh, Austin is is just a, a powerhouse. He's an international speaker again. He, he's great on tiktok he moved his audience from tiktok to youtube and went from something like five or six thousand subscribers to a hundred thousand in like three days wow it was just insane to watch and he's on something like six hundred thousand subscribers now Uh, again a lovely guy 
Uh, and then we've just got loads of, so they're my international international speakers. And we've got loads of um, uh, UK and, and Irish speakers. I've got a woman who's, who gets a lot of her leads from YouTube, even though she's a LinkedIn expert. So she's okay. going to do a session on my business track. Um, we've got some TikTok experts. There's just a, a whole bunch of people. But but those guys, oh, do you know who else I've got? I've got a guy called Craig Campbell. And Craig Campbell is like an international um, SEO speaker. I'm sure he charges a fortune for his, his sessions. And we managed to get him at the event and I, I knew I couldn't really afford him afford him. He's given me a great deal. And I think it's because we had a few drinks at Brighton SEO once. <laughs> Happened to find myself in a bar and there he was. And we met each other and and, and we've we've met each other at a few events since. But um he's gonna do a YouTube SEO session. And and you know when I'm thinking the the thing with organizing a conference is trying to think about all the kind of sessions that you could do that will keep people happy. So I knew YouTube SEO was one of them. I've got a, an ads person. I've got, Austin will talk about AI, I'm sure. And we've got an AI session in there as well. So a good like breadth of different kind of topics as well. And hopefully by the time this podcast goes out, uh, we'll be sold out. So you can't come. <laughs> no, no. Hopefully there will still be some tickets available. Um, and we're definitely going to have virtual tickets available as well. So uh, that's all confirmed and in the bag. Brilliant. Brilliant. Do you know what? I am super, super excited. Uh, yes. Genius Link, we're definitely going to be there. Absolutely. Um, Want to be uh, uh, representing the brand. And uh, I'm just really excited to see the uh, see the speakers. And great that you've bagged some, some exclusives. That's yeah, yeah. That's great. I, I, I think this is the thing um, about events, right? Like events are the place where you really meet people and make like relationships. And people talk about lifelong relationships, but... I met Nick in 2018, you know, that's five years ago. Right. Um, and there's a, a great relationship that was built up. And, and you know, I'm, I've met Austin a year or so before, met, met him at Social Media Marketing World. So, like, really go to these things, go and get involved in And don't think if you're an introvert and you, you're not, you don't like around being around people. I know plenty of introverts at the events. Uh, one of my speakers, uh, Ian, I'm, I'm sure Ian says he's an introvert. Uh, Ian Anderson Gray, and he's an international speaker as well, but he's from the UK. Um, you know, there's there's no real excuse here. I know it can be tough for some people to get to these events, but but just the relationships you made make are just golden. And and you you know when you think about the the conversations that you can have, some people will charge you a whole bunch of money if you was to have an hour of time, of their time. Mm-hmm. But you can stand at the bar with them, and you can uh, you know uh, chew their ear off with and get information from them. You know, so. Uh, it's def- definitely worth it, I think. Oh, do you know what? So looking forward to it. Absolutely. It yes. is, it's going to be amazing. The inaugural, the one, the first of at least 10. Yeah. First of at least 10. Yeah. yeah, like that. yeah no, yeah. it'd be absolutely brilliant. Um, so I want to dig into a couple of extra little bits around um, some of the tips and tricks that uh, that you share most often. So yeah. uh, obviously Genius Link is very much affiliate marketing tied into products and um, and making sure that we're mapping the links to exactly where they need to go to make sure that we're making that customer journey from as from the moment they click to the moment they purchase as short and as sweet as possible. Yeah. So what are some of the tips and, and tricks that you can share with us that whether it's a be with Genius League or, or any other product, what are some of the, the tips that you keep going back to that you like to uh, let people know they should be using? Um, and share with our audience. Yeah, well, I think you, you mentioned affiliate links there and obviously what your product does. I, I think if you think about it from a strategic point from the start, your channel, uh, that's where you're going to win. So, you know, I've seen a lot of people on TikTok and various other platforms where they'll talk about a product and get loads of views and they'll think, damn, if only I'd have got a affiliate link in there, <laughs> you know, and it's too late by that point. And there's some videos you'll find on TikTok where they work out how much so-and-so could have made if they'd have managed to have thought about it ahead of time. So what what I really ask people to do, and I don't want this to be like uh, analysis paralysis in terms of planning, but what I really want you to do is just be strategic with it from the start. Like just, just um, a friend of mine talks about when you're in business, running your business like it's a million-dollar business 
from day one. Mm. So what would a million dollar business do in this situation? Now, okay, some situations, my budget for my conference, for example, I wish there was more things I could do with that, but I'm restricted in finances. But that doesn't mean I can't make the experience feel like a million dollar business um, and do some other things that could really add to that. So if you think about your channel, you think about your social media in general, if you treat it like, if I was Gary V, what would I be doing here? Um, Gary V is just, just an example, right? Yeah. But it's like setting up those affiliate links, making sure that things, um, if you're promoting something, that you've got those relationships built. Have you got all your links in your description? Um, have you got links in your, if you're doing the Instagram, the swipe up stuff, you know, in the bio, all that kind of stuff. Like that's all part of the, how, how what's the user journey going to be like from the moment they see you and they view your video and they decide they like you, what is the next steps for them? And what do you do? Look at your own user journey. When you find someone you like, what do you do? You, you go into their bio, you go into click on the links, you know, how does that feel for the users as well? Okay, brilliant. So you talked about gear a little bit earlier. And yeah. and, and I, there is a whole uh, gear acquisition syndrome, right? Yeah. Um, and and don't, don't worry, I love a shiny object. But there are definitely a few pieces of equipment that I think are absolutely my go-to. It's my, my favorite. And, and it's yeah. not necessarily the most expensive. It's not necessarily the cheapest one. But what's that one piece of gear, that one piece of kit... That you that just think, do you know what? I cannot live without it. What's the thing I cannot live without? I, uh, it's really silly because I think about all the bits of gear. I've got some lighting here. I've got a nice camera. And of course, you can't really live without those things because you need those to do the video. But one thing I talk about often is simplicity. I think I'm a really lazy videographer. I really... And, and I don't know if you or anyone listening has ever been in this position, but you think to yourself, right, I'm going to do some batch filming today and I'm going to set up my gear. I'm going to film four, eight, 12 videos, whatever it might be. And you spend an hour setting up your gear. And by the time you set up the app, you spend the hour doing it. Something's not worked. Something wasn't plugged in right or whatever. You're so low energy. You're like, oh my God, I can't be bothered to film this. Or you film it and you can just see that you're just tired or exhausted or whatever. Or you filmed the first video and the microphone didn't work, so there's no sound on it. So all of those things that happen, I've just had so many experiences of that. When I first started my YouTube channel, I did that. Um, I did four videos and the it was blurry because it autofocus didn't work, right. and it died inside when I did it. You know. Um. So what I talk to people about now is I talk about having a setup that's a permanent setup, so that you can click a few buttons and away you go. So if I think in my office now, are you going to use this on YouTube? These videos, or are you just going to the audio owner? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. YouTube, so we're great. we're we're doing a a full uh, content repurposing. It will be absolutely everywhere. Excellent. Right. So so I can demonstrate this right. But then when I'm speaking to my clients, I'm always talking about like make it so it's easy, so you can quickly start recording. So if you've got an idea, which is why people use their mobile phones so often, because it's quick and it's simple, right? So I come into my office, I turn my camera on, or off as it may be. Um, so I can do that now, I can demonstrate this, right? So I'm so I'm off. You can okay. see we've got no signal, and my lighting is off. So I turn my camera on, and you'll see my camera come back on. This is specifically on your YouTube channel. I press a button and both my lights come on, and that's it. I've also actually got a remote for the lights behind me, so I can turn them on and off. And that's it. That's three buttons. Uh, when I... I've seen Nick Nimim, he, he published a video recently about his um, setup like that. And he presses a button and it starts a whole bunch of programs as well. I am getting to the answer to your question. So all of this comes because I have a Stream Deck. Right. Right. To Stream Deck, just press the buttons. Okay, I have to turn my camera on, but I press the buttons, everything happens, and I'm ready. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing. Like, just whenever I've not got that, I'm like, oh. Wish I had it. And it's one of those purchases you like. It's just a piece of plastic with buttons on it that are programmable. Yeah. Like it seems like such a ridiculous purchase. They're not cheap either. Um, but when you've got them, you can't live without them. Brilliant. Now, it's, you know what? It's 
it's it's what I was looking for is that that one piece of equipment that has that special place in your heart, and and certainly this yeah. Dream Deck sounds. Absolutely I, I want to know if anyone else says the Stream Deck because. I think they go down the camera route or something like that. But street, yeah, for me, that's it. Brilliant. So on the flip side then, um, and you have been doing this, you know, you've been doing this a long time. Yeah. Is there a piece of equipment that you had such high hopes for, but you've just either not found yourself using or... Or or I only use three times before I broke it. Can I talk about that one? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. There's definitely a story there. Fire away. Uh, so... I think the most um, exuberant, is that the word? I, I think the most unnecessary purchase is a drone. Right. right. I think anyone that buys a drone, actually, in practical terms, when you're using it, they're not really that great to use. They create this epic footage. You're like, oh, my God, it's epic footage. But, like, you need to have other things available to use a drone. And if you're doing some cool drone shots, you can't have you standing there with a control. So you kind of need to do two or you need an operator or whatever. So I think a drone is uh, over the top. But I, and the first one I had was a DJI Phantom 4. I went to the photography show in the UK, which is like, uh, you talked about gas before. If you've got gear acquisition syndrome, do not go to the photography. It's called photography and videography show now, I think. And it's just like a dream. It's like porn for uh, camera people, you know. Um, and I bought, of course, I bought a drone, so I bought it, and we used it for a couple of weddings, and then we found out we needed a license for it. We couldn't use it for the weddings because we need a license. And in the end, I was just like, so we'd used it maybe two or three times just to test it and everything. And in the end, I was like, do you know what? Let's just use it for a little bit of footage. Nobody will really know, but we'll we'll just put it in there and just ignore the fact we need a, a license for it. And I was flying it backwards, and I said to the guys who worked for me at the time and at the wedding i was like you don't fly it backwards it's got no sensor detection so if you fly it backwards you just got to be careful and of course you know where this is going no yeah we I, I was at this really beautiful country manor i've got this great footage of the drone flying backwards and we did it in like 60 frames a second so we was able to slow it down beautiful the the grooms when we're just getting out of this limo going into this country house and I flew it back into the only tree in the field. There was only one in massive field, just one tree. And I just flew it. And, just, and we've got this uh, 10 second clip where it hits the tree and just sort of goes upside down and then hits the hits the floor. So uh, that was 600 mm. pounds. And I used it three times and broke it. And it was fully broke, you know, like tried to fix it and it just did not work at all. So, so that's it. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, and, and apologies for bringing that memory back up. Yeah, yeah. No, it is good. I like, I, I like it. And the, the little video that we've got, um, my editor did this beautiful, nice shot. And then he's put down, I don't know if you know, Down With A Sickness by Disturbed. But th- th- that's that's the, the music we used as it crashed. So oh. it's a funny moment. Uh, you can have those funny moments. It, it, time helps, doesn't it? You know, being able to look back and then... Uh, and, and yeah, totally, yeah. And all the new drones have, um, you know, detection of that stuff now. So, you know, technology moved on and solved that problem. But at the time, I just happened to get the drone before the one that had um, detection of stuff around it. So, yeah. So you mentioned technology is moving on. I'm going to ask the inevitable question. And yeah. Yeah, potentially whatever you say is going to be completely out of date by the time this goes live uh, goes out <laughs> so are you using and how are you using uh ai currently in uh, in your business and and is that helping you to run your channel manage your business yeah um so i think the only thing we're really using ai for no well there's a couple of a couple of things so uh, do you know opus clips have you seen opus yeah i uh, really love opus i met the guy um connor who's uh, one of the guys at, at that business and it was the i met him at social media marketing world and it was like the day they were before they were launching and he told me about it and i was like oh my god this sounds amazing uh for anyone that doesn't know opus is um a, a piece of software where you upload a video it finds the best clips in that video using ai and tell, it gives you a virality score the chance of it going viral just brilliant so so stuff like that i think from a content repurposing point of view it's an easy yes to say for that kind of software. And then, of course, ChatGPT for things like descriptions. Uh, we have this great little um, uh, Chrome plugin called Glasp. 
and it will um you upload your video to youtube you know private or draft or whatever and it will um as long as it can see it it will take this the transcript from the video put it into chat gpt and then it will give you a summary of your video which you can then use for your summary on your channel or you, you could then use it for your you know blog post or whatever um but just taking that and putting it straight into chat gpt in, in an instant it, you know you click the button it does it stuff like that i just think it's fascinating and then we've got like planning so we've done some planning you can you know ask for better titles you can ask for better hooks uh scripts i'm not a big fan of scripts myself i don't use scripts but i know people that do use scripts chat gpt will just help you do all of that stuff so i just think it's like having a just an amazing assistant Mm. to be able to use because you know it's still you that's doing the work and filming um austin is the guy who's going to the conference one of the speakers he's got a company called syllabi where they'll create your tra- your scripts and your title and your hooks and everything. And they've just started doing where you can create an AI version of yourself and then it will look like you talking as though it's you and it's not you. Yeah. I mean, that is... All of a sudden, I could create videos where my, my VA could create the videos for me, which is insane. Yeah. You head to the beach, videos still yeah. go on. Yeah, absolutely. So then, because then I think about like courses and I think of other things. You know, we tried, um, I don't know if you've seen in Descript, they've got a uh, something called Overdub. Yeah. The Descript allows you to, cre- Overdub allows you to create a voice of yourself. And I tried it and it didn't quite have all my, I think they're called intonations and some of the other stuff that happens within your voice. It didn't have all of that stuff and it wasn't quite right. But I, I think you're like, it's coming. You know, you say it's about it being outdated. I know just like month by month, this stuff is really, really uh, adding value to, to us. And I hope it doesn't replace us. Yeah. I hope it does just stay and add value to us, but uh, it remains to be seen. Okay, so here's the question then. Uh, do you say please and thank you? Yes, all the time, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. I asked my uh, VA, um, my business manager the other day, I was like, you know, when you're talking to chat GPT, do you always say please? And she was like, yep. Because you do, you see, you can't, you can't get out of that. You hold the door open for someone when they're walking past, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't, that's, it's part of your being. You don't, you either do it or you don't. I'm still amazed. I go to the toilet and, you know, back, restroom, bathroom, whatever. And people don't wash their hands. I'm like, what are you doing? You, you horrible human being. Like that's just, it's just ingrained in my, in my, in my brain, you know, in my body. Um, I think the, it's, it, yeah, it's funny, the, the, the please and thank you. I think the, being putting great it, it goes back to what you're saying about consistency right it, yeah. it is just part of that whole consistency um if you're doing one thing one way then you will do it every single time every single time yeah. you try and attempt it because once it because it, the thing about consistency is w- once you become consistent it doesn't feel like you're trying to be consistent anymore it's just natural yeah. you're just doing it uh, and and that's why actually when people are starting YouTube channels, my big thing to them, they, they spend so much time doing their first video, planning and all of this kind of stuff because of all the nervousness. But I say, like, just go and film it. Like, go and do it today. What's stopping you doing that? Well, I've got this, I've got that. And I'm like, no, just go and film it now. Just go and do it. Because the next time it's going to be better. And the next time after that, and the next time after that, like, you've got to get off the blocks. It's, it's so frustrating to me, the people that just plan forever. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up, but I do want to know before we do. Yeah. And you've given a great piece of advice there, but I am going to plug you for one one more. What's the one yeah. piece that you would want to leave with our audience today? Um, and whether that be around using the technology, their consistency, or maybe it's uh, in particular about revenue. Uh, yes, my simple piece of advice is... Um, if you've not got a YouTube channel now, you need to start now, like right now, today. Go and stop what you're listening to and go and start a YouTube channel. So many people wait and they'll pick TikTok and they'll pick Instagram Reels because it's quick, it's um, it's instant gratification. But actually, when YouTube pays off in year two or year three, so you have to start now. Start making videos, get used to that. And eventually, you've got to go, oh, I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad I did those 50 before me because 
the revenue will come, the views will come, the followers will come, and then everything is easier after that. Brilliant. Thank you. And right. where can our audience find you? Uh, so I'm on kingofvideo.co.uk, kingofvideo.co.uk. Uh, that's how I came up with the title. Most kings steal their title, and I stole mine because a domain name was available. Uh, so if you head over to there, you'll find loads of freebies and all that kind of stuff as well. Wonderful. Thank you again for joining us and sharing your road to revenue.